early. It might make this more exciting. Yeah. Uh, so I was just trying one of Noah's products backstage, and it kind of freaked me out a little bit, so we'll talk about that. Um, but to start out, uh, I know in the music tech space, there is a big conversation about people who come in in the music from the music world versus who have always been in the tech world. And you were a bit of an outsider coming into the space. You had background in music and film. Uh, so tell me a little bit about that and how you found your way to founding Doppler in the first place. Yeah, so I'm not an engineer. I'm not a technologist. I actually don't know that much, or I didn't know that much about technology. Now I know it way too much. <laughs> um, but for me, uh, kind of the ethos of Doppler at the beginning, and we're on a music stage, was how can we make the music experience really right for each individual? Mm -hmm. uh, when we listen to recorded music, you have this perfectly curated experience, right? They've mastered this piece of music. You can EQ it usually in your car, turn the volume up and down. But if I go to a show, especially at, let's say, you know, a venue at 2 a.m. and the With guys had, acoustics? I've had four never Jack and that. Cokes, right? <laughs> and it's an engineer. You have no idea. That's a complete uh, crapshoot. And so a lot of it started thinking about the human ear as this really incredible sense that's really personal, right? You may hear a guitar wail and go, oh my God. And I might be like, ah, yeah. Like yes. we all have very <laughs> different reactions to audio, right? Mm -hmm. And so we started thinking about that vis-a-vis -vis how can we personalize that experience? And for me, what's really interesting is music has such an emotive connection to us that technology has an ability to really amplify that, right? Mm -hmm. and we were just uh, on the stage before where people from Ticketmaster, like the live experience is an incredible way for us to connect with other humans, with our own emotions, with music we love. Um, we're really interested in how does that evolve as technology becomes more and more part of it. If you even think, I just came back from two weekends straight at Coachella, it, six days in the desert. Congratulations on surviving. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you even just think about how much tech goes into each stage and the delay towers and there's so much of what, you know, we're no longer going to see a symphony in the round. Yeah. All of this is enabled by technology. And so mm -hmm. the question becomes, how does that continue to evolve? And one of the questions we ask ourselves a lot is, how does that become more personal? Because right now it's still very uh, diffuse, democratized in, in both a good and a bad way. But if you're standing in the back, you may be having a very different, especially Coachella is incredible acoustics, but at some yeah. festivals, you're having a very different auditory experience than if you're in the front, and there's some interesting questions there. I had never thought about it, but it is, I mean, a live show is the ultimate in democracy. It's like you get there, you are where you are, and that defines your experience completely. Yeah, that in sports. It's kind yes. of like that you, you are all there It's together. a free-for-all. Yeah. <laughs> um, so why did this space feel like one that was exciting to get into right now, and did it feel like there were risks inherent in doing music and tech right now? Yeah, so I wouldn't say our comp so the heritage of the company is definitely in music because my history is in music. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of the core idea of the company is much more uh, broad, right? It's the idea that we've built this, right, this product here one, which you saw, right? So these two little tiny buds that you can put in your ear and control how you hear the world as well as stream music. Um, and the idea is it's the first computer for the ears. And we envision a world in the future, if you kind of think about the film Her or Star Trek or, you know, Babblefish, like this thing can act as a translator. It can act like a language translator, right? It can act mm. as your ability to get smart notifications from Siri. And we believe in the future we will have products in our ears that leverage the headphone as a baseline, but mm -hmm. allow you to do a lot more. Now, how that ties into music is we actually started with a product that was an earplug, a musician's earplug and evolve from there. And mm -hmm. as you heard, one of the key features of this product is a live mix. So I think for us, uh, what we're most interested in is we believe technology in the ears is going to be a huge part of the future of wearable computing, computing in general, and is going to be one of the key things that gets us past the mobile world we're in right now. Because if you think about it, even think about a concert, right? It's a great place. Mm -hmm. I'll stand in the back of a concert, and of course I'm always observing these things, and you see a stage, and then you see a sea of screens. Yes, right? completely, yeah. There's literally a, a barrier between you and that experience that mm -hmm. is supposed to be live. And, all, and uh, one of the big things we think about is how can you maybe, and, and I'm not saying specific to the concert experience, but how do you get people a little bit more out of their screens? Because for me, I spend my days like this. And yeah. you're sitting next to me, and I'm going, oh, two seconds. 
but if I have a near piece in that actually gives me information, you and I can be talking and maybe I just get a little ding or your meeting's running late and we can still have a conversation. And be engaged, and yeah. Part of the reason the product's called here is we want you to be present while you're using it. We want you to feel part of the world. And the phone is an incredible device, but it, it's distracting. It removes you a lot from the moment. And yeah. we think we can change that. I feel like at concerts lately, I'm just amazed by like the number of people who just there's something between them and the performance. And oh, yeah. I wonder why they're at a live performance in the first place, which leads me to, I mean, there is the evolving question of how VR and AR will affect our interest in the live experience and will they replace it? And I mean, it sounds to me like you're really coming from a place of not wanting to replace it just to make it better. Yeah. But do you see that as like an immediate concern for uh, fans or something that is pretty far in the future still? Which aspect specifically? Like uh, Just whether the live experience is going to be replaced as these sort of augmented so, reality so I, things. I don't, think, I don't think it's ever going to be ever is a long time, but I yeah. don't think in any time soon. And for me, I, I'm, I'm not interested in VR. I, I, you know, there are specific things where removing yourself fully from the world makes sense. I understand it for mm -hmm. gaming. Sure, maybe you want to see, you know, uh, the Roskilde Festival and you're sitting in Santa Barbara. There's going to be these interesting yeah. things, but I think there's nothing like getting in a room with a lot of other sweaty, passionate people, right? Mm -hmm. Hearing something live. Um, I think the question becomes how do those things intermingle as we move forward? But I, I don't think it's in human nature to be tribal, to get together, to experience things together, to turn to the person next to you who's smiling ear to ear and enjoy that experience together. I don't think that's going anywhere. Again, I think, I think how it evolves is what's interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting to think about how the live, I mean, I'm curious whether you think the live experience has change that much over the decades or whether being in a concert today is really a very similar experience to what it was like at Woodstock or a I think it's ago. well Woodstock's the first thing to, way, way before my time so I can't <laughs> I can't comment specifically but um, I think at its core the live experience so there's a lot of interesting topics here right one is the live experience is the core of musical ex expression what I mean by that is like if you get all the way existential there's kind of three things that have been part of human condition forever. You have to eat, you have to have sex, and you, you listen to music. It's, <laughs> it's weird, but it's true. If you actually go back to the earliest civilizations across the board, music is a part of mating ritual, you know, uh, pass it, you know growing up, rites mm -hmm. of, of passing, all these different things. Music is just part of us. We sing, we're, right? we call. And music was always, until the invention of the phonograph, a live thing. You couldn't not have a live music experience. Yeah. It was ephemeral by nature. And then the phonograph mm -hmm. was created and we lived in this really odd 150 year paradigm where we can own music. Which if you think about it it's in the It's a strange concept. It's a really <laughs> strange concept if you think about it in the spectrum of human you know, existence. Mm -hmm. And I think what's really interesting is the live experience of course is still carried on because it's so different emotively than that recorded experience. So. It's a long-winded way of saying, I think, I think that the live experience will, um, will, be, will continue to be part of the human experience. What I'm interested in is, okay, take this product, right? What this allows me to do is, if that live experience, and this is where, to answer your question now, it's changed. Mm -hmm. If it's a little too loud, I no longer need to just put tissue in my ear. That is bad. If I've spent $300, <laughs> that's not what I want to do. With yeah. this product, I can, with full fidelity, turn down the volume three decibels, hear it exactly as I want, but a little quieter. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're maybe hard of hearing. Maybe you need to amplify at three decibels. And maybe you're a complete audiophile and you're like, this needs more reverb. Well, we have a reverb button. And so you start <laughs> thinking about how that really makes it so that experience is more personal. I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting way to start thinking about how does this live experience become truly yours mm -hmm. well life is often better with a reverb button i would think <laughs> or bass boost bass boost is, yes, uh, bass boost is always a good thing pretty too. fun too so tell me a little bit about you launched two products at coachella yeah. so i was curious about how that happened why coachella felt like the right place to do it and how uh, that went they are the arbiters leaders and gods of festivals like they just <laughs> i mean it golden voice is incredible Paul, Skip, and Bill, the guys who run it, are geniuses, and they all have very amazing roles within this. Uh, I literally met Paul Tillette and showed him my earplug mm -hmm. and said, 
I think this has, you know, it's obviously very different than a foam ear plug. I think it has, it's, this product's called the Dubs. Um, and he said, I want one for every single person at the festival. And I said, uh, you're kidding. He said, no, nope, I'm going to buy 140,000 of those. <laughs> and I said, that sounds really okay. great. Thank you. <laughs> um, but it start, first thing, it made me realize how passionate that group is, not only about festivals, but about the fan experience. And they mm -hmm. were very passionate about hearing health and about just ensuring that, that Coachella maintains, to, keeps being at the cutting edge of pushing the boundaries of what it means to go to a live event. And so that catalyzed a relationship. We were in the welcome box in 2015 with the dubs. And then when we created our first digital product here, Active Listening, which was all about live augmentation, similarly, mm -hmm. went and showed Paul. He said, this is the craziest thing I've you know, ever tried. Why don't you guys launch it with us? He said, that sounds fantastic because it's for a live event. Yeah. Um, it's been one of the most rewarding partnerships and relationships this company's ever had because it's a lot of times partnerships are really transactional. In this case, it's uh, there's a deep... Uh, shared interest in pushing the boundaries of the music experience while still mm -hmm. really making sure they're all about making sure it's organic. They're all about making sure that it's really uh, it's part of the experience but doesn't adulterate that. And mm -hmm. they're also not scared of technology. And so that's a really nice balance to say how do we do this in a way that really enhances the fan experience but doesn't get in the way in it. And it's optional, right? We didn't push the digital product on anyone. If you yeah. wanted to buy it to enhance your experience, you had a really elegant way to do that. So what kind of feedback did you get after the first Coachella and were there lessons that you learned that sort of affected how you developed the second product? Yeah, that? definitely. Um, so we were really focused on a lot of the live mix features, reverb, the enhancements. Mm -hmm. We got a ton of feedback that people were actually as interested, if not more so, in the noise filters. So when we mm -hmm. launched at Coachella, that product that part of the product was still in beta, but we got a ton of feedback that people wanted more access to white noise and wanted more access to reductions and wanted more access to filters that actually gave them more curation on the space they were in. So in this new product, you have an airplane filter. What it does is it reduces the jet engine, but you and I can still talk. Hmm. So imagine getting on a plane and we're like, wow, that rumble's awful. You hit one button, rumble goes away, your voice doesn't. Right? So the flight attendant comes up to me, I can still talk to her and I have a product in my ears. I can still mm -hmm. talk to her totally normally. And again, this is a really small, elegant little piece of the, well, I have yeah. something in my ear, I can't do that. <laughs> but right, it's this little thing, right? And I can just put it in my ear and actually these are on and I can hear you totally normally even though there's something in my ear, right? And so it definitely enhanced the way we thought of this product because we recognize that the full spectrum of what we call tune in and tune out. This product should allow you to do both, mm -hmm. should give you a lot of ability of kind of what we call superhuman hearing, while still the baseline of the product is just natural acoustics. You put it in and it just sounds like there's nothing in your ears, and that's mm -hmm. the purpose of it. And I would think at Coachella in particular, there is a lot of white noise and noise to filter out De and kind definitely. of focus on one part of the experience. De absolutely, and, and uh, again, I think the meta point we got back is the more, pe the more options we have for control, the better. Like let's, let's broaden that spectrum, which was awesome. It wasn't like everyone's using reverb. Mm -hmm. It was like actually people are really interested in the full spectrum because all of us have different preferences. Mm -hmm. So you had mentioned to me, so you've had some big uh, music people investing in Doppler and yep. I know you mentioned Hans Zimmer yeah. as one of them, the uh, big composer who it feels like he has his hands in everything innovative these he days. He just played Coachella. It was amazing. Yes, his first Coachella ever. Yeah. I would have liked to follow him around for that. <laughs> He's it like the amazing. oldest man at Coachella, but awesome. It was, it was incredible. <laughs> uh, so how did you connect with him and what has he done working with you? So Hans, uh, similar situation. It started with the earplug. Uh, the, it was like the gift <laughs> it all that... all started with an earplug. No, it did. It, it was like <laughs> the gift that kept on giving because it gave us... I think a lot of... This is just from a startup perspective. Like a lot of companies have big visions but can't prove their ability to execute early on. Mm -hmm. If I had walked in and been like, I'm going to build an in-ear computer. I said, what do you have? I have like a schematic and a team. It'd be like, come back when you... But I showed up and said... I've built an earplug that's better than any other earplug. It's not digital, it's not, but it's a product. Try it. Mm -hmm. I'd get a call always the next day being like, that's the greatest earplug I've ever tried. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the leap of faith of, okay, we'll take the bet. There's other things. So Hans started with just him and I riffing, which was incredible for an hour, uh -huh. on what it means to play music. And he has a very interesting idea of this idea of play, right? It's not mm -hmm. make, it's 
music is an act. It's, it's part of, uh, and he has these really interesting ideas. He, he'll le lean in and he'll say, there's not one type of silence. There are many types of silence. And you say, You're like, Whoa. I, I don't really know what that means, but that's incredible. Uh, <laughs> but it's a great example of, um, for us, it was really important early on to not do things in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So we actually sought out, especially as we were dealing with the live music space, we wanted to make sure we, again, adulteration, that's bad. And mm -hmm. one of the greatest feats, so uh, Hans Zimmer ended up investing and becoming an advisor, Mark Ronson, Quincy Jones, David Geffen, like people who are, are, are true titans, not only on the side of the business, but on the musical side. Yeah. And it was important to us to show early versions of the product and say, do you think that this is staying true to the live experience? And the feedback we kept getting, and Hans was a perfect, he said, look, when I record something, I get a room, I get to make it perfect. So if I show up at a live experience, or you talk to Mark, it's everything is an X factor. Yeah. The speaker system, the, if I don't bring my own engineer, what time of day it is, is it humid? Like, if you give someone the control to actually have, make that experience right, that's awesome. And so we really worked closely with these people to make sure, again, there was an organic, way for us to develop this product in tandem with people who you know live and breathe what the the space we were working in yeah well it brings up the interesting idea of you know when you make recorded music you think of it as having a final form and this really increases the like mutability of music and that it is always evolving depending on how someone wants to experience and it. that's part of the reason the live show is so amazing it is still uh, to use a term for new Orleans, it's still jazz yeah do you know what i mean like it, it, even if the show is not improvised, it is always going to be different. Yeah. It is always going to be, even if the set, like no one live experience is the same. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the reason it's so awesome and, and gives, you know, there's so much energy behind it because putting a CD, you're gonna hear the same track every time. And what a, I mean, just the people you mentioned, what an amazing array of experience with like engineering and production to bring to you. I mean, like, what did Quincy have to say about it? Uh, <laughs> I so, would take whatever he says as, like, Bible. <laughs> well, one of the most interesting things with, so Quincy wear, wears hearing aids. Huh. And this product is, a, a, you know, in its essence, a super amplifier. And you give Hear One to someone who has mild to moderate hearing loss, and you put it in their ears, and most of them start crying. Because, oh, wow. oh yeah, it is a fundamentally different audio experience. If you think about a hearing aid, compresses all the audio and the only purpose of it is saying can you hear voice if you can hear voice it's like even if it sounds like it's coming out of a walkie-talkie from world war one it's a huge because you go from not being able to hear to being mm -hmm. able to hear something our product is full fidelity we have the top of the line mems microphones a balanced armature speaker so you put it in and for example our director of accessibility and advocacy has been deaf since she was three and we gave her one of the mm -hmm. earliest versions of the first product and she walked outside and started weeping and said I heard my footsteps for the first time. Wow. It's incredible, right? So yeah. you, again, in that, it was one of those moments where it's like, oh, this has beyond just music, huge implications for, so his feedback was keep that amplification thing, keep like, let's keep working on that because that's incredible. I've never, I haven't been able to hear that fidelity in a very long time. <laughs> Amazing. Well, that's an incredibly uplifting note to end on, yep. I think. So I look forward to trying it. And thank you so much, Noah. Cheers. Thank cool. you. Thanks.